and welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I'm a Trekkie. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss Galaxy Quest, which came out in 1999. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis? Well, the story follows a group of actors who starred on the hit TV series Galaxy Quest. Their series is cancelled and they spend most of their time trying to make ends meet by making money from conventions and guest appearances. Their commander, played by Jason Nesmith, played by Tim Allen, meets up with a group of fans who actually turn out to be aliens from the Klaatu Nebula. Once he convinces all of the crew to come with him to help defeat a war general called Saris, the crew realise that science fiction might actually become science fact. This is a PG science fiction comedy movie from director Dean Parasot, whose other theatrical work includes Red 2 and Fun with Dick and Jane. Mm. But uh, he's much more of a TV uh, director, uh, which is to say that obviously working with a movie which is inspired by TV shows from the 60s is yeah. a pretty good choice. However, he wasn't the first director lined up to make this film. This film actually went through a number of different directors and writers and producers because they, again, could not decide on the tone of the film. Much like Gremlins, yeah. this film was originally slated to be like an 18 R-rated movie with lots of foul language, nudity, sex scenes and, and the like. However, few directors, uh, including Spielberg, decided to tone the film back Mm. And which, of course, upset the current director, which was Harold Ramis, uh, who also wanted different actors involved in the project before it eventually went to Dean Parasot and the film that we have now. Remember, mum is the word. Certainly, but... Um, mum. 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 I love this film. Exactly. It's I just you know as a as a science fiction fan, as a Star Trek fan, and a Star Wars fan, and all that kind of stuff. The moment this film starts with that historical, we're just going to stick that in now. Historical footage of the Galaxy Quest missions. You know, you've got the plywood ship and the the bad hairdos and the the really dodgy karate kung fu. But who didn't ever enjoy watching that kind of stuff? You know, this this film kind of harkens back for me, like we said. Star Trek, every, every single series from the original all the way up to Enterprise. You know, we're talking Babylon 5. We're, we're talking Space 1999. We're talking Blake 7. We're talking the Battlestar Galactica one, you know, series, both of them. Sequest DSV. I just wanted to throw that one in there. That one doesn't get a shout out that much often. And, and it just, oh, it's just every single one of the actors is just, brilliant you know once you get that first opening bit where they're all in the back room getting ready for their performance you've got tommy the little boy who piloted the ship when he was younger now he's a lot older of course it's paying respects to i guess will wheaton who played yeah. uh, wesley crusher in the next generation yeah you've got tony shalob who i'm a big fan of from the monk tv series you know uh, he... the director also directed the pilot episode for monk so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and Tony Shalhoub plays plays the engineer. I think it's Fred Kwan. I think his name was. <laughs> I, I I lose the names because I get distracted by the actors playing playing the characters playing the act. You've got the gorgeous Sigourney Weaver in this film. She is, of course, this, you know, science fiction sort of demigod. Yeah, and yeah. of course that wig, because <laughs> yeah. damn, yeah. Do you know she actually kept that wig after production? Nice. <laughs> I, I'd probably make her wear it. <laughs> oh my god. You you have the fabulous Alan Rickman uh, playing Dr. Lazarus, who, you know, sadly we did lose this year, but, I mean, it, he, he harkens back to Leonard Nimoy and Spock from Star Trek. So you've got these classical trained actors playing these science fictional characters. and I played Richard III. Five curtain calls. There were five curtain calls. I was an actor once. Damn it, now look at me. Look at me! I can't go out there and I won't say that stupid line one more time. And and then you finally have Tim Allen playing Jason Nesmith playing Commander Taggart and obviously, well, just a mirror image of William Shatner, isn't he? 
impossible. It is impossible to talk about this film without talking about Star Trek. Yeah. Because that is its, you know, 90% of this film is inspired from Star Trek. To the point where this film has been categorized as a Star Trek film. <laughs> At a recent Star Trek convention, they did a poll of all of the fans to see the ranking order of all the Star Trek films. Galaxy Quest is the seventh best Star Trek film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd go with that, yeah. <laughs> and and it's for good reason, because it doesn't belittle or or insult any of the fans of Star Trek. It it sort of pokes fun at the actors, but at yeah. the same time, it's sort of because we're aware of William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy and yeah, the yeah. fact that you have these actors that are Shakespearean theatrical actors, you know, that um, are, are heralded as one of the best in their field. Yeah. And yet they put on these funny ears <laughs> yeah, and they or... say a silly line and that is it. That is them for the rest of their lives. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we see it today when you have Game of Thrones actors or Walking Dead actors and like, oh, I can't get any other work. I'm only remembered for this. Yeah. And, you know, and so this is portrayed perfectly in this film where it is a parody but it doesn't insult your intelligence with its humor no it's no. sort of it sort of pats you on the back like for being a fan of these these films it's like you're in on the joke now yeah yeah i i, I like that as well like i said you know the the little in jokes that pop in there now and again like we said with with alan rickman playing dr lazarus i love the fact he's always wearing his headgear yeah, there's there's the scene where he, where Sigourney Weaver calls him, and he's walking around his apartment with the headgear still on, and it's the fact that you know he he kind of feels comfortable in it. Well, I guess he's worn it so many times now he kind of forgets he has it on. That's it. Yeah, he just he just forgets, and he even says himself after a while, "I'm not saying that line ever again." You know, I'm I'm not saying that line. Which does remind me of actors like Bruce Campbell, who at conventions is always asked to say, this is my boomstick. And he yeah. always says, I'm not your monkey, you know? <laughs> and so, again, it's just parodying those sort of... That, well, that's it. It nods back to, obviously, Spock, and everyone just runs up to him like, hey, you know? And he's like, I did do other things, you know? I have done other things. And it's kind of, obviously, it reminds me with, with Alan Rickman when he passed, you know, social media just kind of exploded with all of these references of films that he'd been through. And yet there was only a couple of people who'd actually said the lines from Galaxy Quest. And I was like, oh shit, yeah, you know, we gotta review that film. <laughs> Uh, rounding out the cast, we also have Darren Mitchell, and we also have Sam Rockwell. Oh yeah, who have I have continued to say is now one of my absolute favorite actors. His part in this film is that of the red shirt from yeah. almost every episode of Star Trek ever. <laughs> I love the fact his name's Guy. <laughs> is there, Guy number seven? <laughs> he. It's the fact that he is sort of genre savvy. He is aware of the fact that he is in a sort of Star Trek episode. Yeah. And he's constantly aware of the fact that he is the red shirt who is going to die. He said that he was inspired by Hudson from Aliens <laughs> and of course for his, for his inspiration for playing this character. I changed my mind. I want to go back. After the fuss you made about getting left behind. Yeah, but that's what I thought. I was the crewman that stays on the ship and something is up there. And it kills me. But now I'm thinking I'm the guy who gets killed by some monster five minutes after we land on the planet. We also have a very early performance from Rain Wilson as one of the funky looking aliens. Yeah, yeah. And we also have Justin Long and of course his film debut. And of course he would go on to eventually get turned into a giant tusk creature. <laughs> that guy seems to die a lot. He does die a lot, doesn't yeah. he? <laughs> yeah. As the film progresses, the guys are constantly going to these conventions and you can tell that there's a lot of hostility between the crew and the commander. He, you know, is always putting himself out there and his crew kind of in the mouths of danger without actually, you know, telling them first. And so they're always kind of on his back. And it isn't until he start he gets like a, you know, realistic kick in the head by a couple of, uh, I don't know, teens who have turned up at the convention and start p 
poking fun at them. You know, this is the only jobs that they'll ever get. This is the only thing that they'll ever get. So he actually starts to, you know, Taggart starts to realize this is how my life has got where it's got to. Yet again, that's inspired by an actual event where William Shatner at a Star Trek convention in the bathroom sort of cubicle yeah. heard fans berating him for being this cliched sort of actor who, of course, we all know the William Shatner tropes. Yeah. And, of course, we all know how most of the cast on Star Trek sort of didn't like him because he was egocentrical. Yeah, He was yeah. the sort of person who would read the script to make sure he had more lines than anybody else. Yeah. He would cut his fellow actors out of the films once he got directorial control of the film. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's sort of emulating those sort of re things that actually happened. But that's where, obviously, after this, it kind of makes a twist because the Thermians turn up. And it turns out that the Thermians are, are a squid-like creature from the Klaatu Nebula. And they have seen the TV transmissions of Galaxy Quest and believe it to be, like I said, historical documents documenting the Galaxy Quest crew going around and kicking ass. So they've constructed the ship and they take Jason to the ship. And I just love the fact that obviously he gets drunk the night before and turns up with a hangover and will only go with them if they have a limo. So they actually get a limo for him and then teleport it. <laughs> <laughs> and then slap him in the commander's chair and they're like, yes, this is, this is, Sar oh, sorry, I'll do the voice. Yes, this is Saraso. I just love their voices. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he fully believes that it's just make-believe, you know, that somebody's they're constructed They're making a this. fan film. Yeah, they <laughs> constructed this on a computer, put it on screensaver too. And it's, it's, it builds up to, I always feel bad that they cut the sequence. But at the same time, I'm glad that it's not in there because it kind of makes you think that it's still make believe. It's where Cyrus is talking and is, you know, and is wanting to negotiate. Cyrus is there for negotiation, and Tim Allen's like, "Yeah, yeah, whatever. Open fire. <laughs> <laughs> fire everything. <laughs> Just fire. Let's get us out of here." Okey dokey. Uh, let's fire blue particle cannons full. Red particle cannons full. Gannett magnets. Fire them left and right, and let them run. All shoot them while you're at it. Once you toss that at him, killer. That should take care of old lobster head, shouldn't it? <laughs> and then he's like, "Right, you can take me home now. Job done. Yeah, Film my cameo." It. And, of course, the reality then hits him when he's presented with the most beautiful space vista you can sort of imagine. Yeah. He's then developed in this sort of molecular goo. Yeah, yeah. And then he's booger flicked across the universe <laughs> into a black hole. <laughs> yeah. And it's pretty precision sort of landing, actually. He lands right back in his apartment. Yeah, right <laughs> next to his swimming pool. <laughs> it's the way that, uh, I, after that, he tries to convince the rest of the crew to go with them. Yeah. And... At first, they think that he's just completely he's lost off his rocker, yeah. you know. Yeah, you know, he's just taking us on another wild goose chase. And I think it's I think it's Quan who actually just turns around and goes, I think we should have just taken the gig. Well, because they're kind of desperate for work. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And so they all kind of, you just see this look on their face of, yeah, actually, you know, he's right. We, we need the work. So they all just run off after him and it's, it's Sigourney Weaver I, I love the fact that she's kind of playing this bumbling blonde but she's not a bumbling blonde she's actually trying to take control mm -hmm. of the scenes you know it's where she's talking to the hologram and she's like you either take all of us or none of us uh, yeah okay you can all come okay <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact that she Sigourney Weaver went on to say that while she was wearing that wig, she actually felt her, her IQ dropping cons consistently <laughs> throughout filming. <laughs> and of course, that makes me laugh because her, her role in the TV series was just to relay everything that the computer terminal <laughs> would say out loud. Yeah. And the thing is, as, as they became more aware that this was reality, she fell into her role. And started to do what she used to do on the TV show anyway. The enemy is matching velocity. Enemy is matching velocity! We're out of the fast time! Gosh, I'm doing it. I'm repeating the darn computer. <laughs> I, love the, I love that line she gives to Tommy. And Tommy's just like, we heard the computer the first time. And she just shouts at him like, I had one job on this ship and I'm going to do it to the best I can. And he's like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Once they get all onto the ship, 
you know, they start to, like we said, they start to settle into their positions. They try to. I, I, I actually forget that they try to tell the Thermians that they're actually actors. And they try to explain to them that they're actually actors. But then they realize that as the situations start to escalate, you know, and Saris, Saris comes back even more pissed off than he was originally. And the ship starts getting damaged and they have to fly through a minefield. They just have to, instead of running around like headless chickens, they have to literally become their parts. I mean, I, I, I want to bring up the ship, actually. I love the fact that the Thermians have seen the historical documents and then possibly found the blueprints that people have made online and then constructed the ship. It's like there's a scene later on where they have to get past the chompers. And I think it's Sigourney <laughs> Weaver who just actually just shouts out, this, this, this was fucking stupid. This episode was really bad. Who puts this in a ship? And it's like, <laughs> yeah, you know, they, the Thermians have literally seen this and gone... Oh, we don't know what it does, but we've got to put it in because it's part of the design. <laughs> Whoever wrote this episode should die! Also, at that moment, it's worth bringing it up now, where you can actually see where some of the dialogue was redubbed yes. in order to get that PG rating. Because when you see those chompers, Sigourney Weaver's original reaction, I think, was right on the nail. Yeah. But of course, you can see exactly what she says whilst it's dubbed. <laughs> I, I, I kind of didn't understand that, but then I realized that obviously with critics, not so much reviewers, but mainly critics, they would have sat and gone, oh, this is based on Star Trek. It's a kid's film. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, they've got swearing in. Well, it's an 18 now. And it's like, well, no, you know, real fans who go to conventions, you don't see eight, five to eight year olds go to conventions on their own. You know, you see like, whole families mm -hmm. you see people with jobs and people with you know money putting into the effects and the the makeup that they bought to make themselves their char favorite characters in their favorite tv shows so to claim that this film you know was dark probably was kind of the wrong view mainly because you were looking at it from the wrong point i see it i see it as i would have rather enjoyed the the swearing you know, because I'm an adult now and I want to hear swearing. It does make it easier to, to show children. Mm -hmm. But then there are a lot of sequences where you're just like, mm, that's not really good for children. I mean, I want to bring up Sigourney Weaver's breasts. You're kidding. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't want to, but then I sat down and watched this film. And as the film progresses, her top becomes more and more open. Damn. You know, there was a deleted scene, actually, where she unzips her top and reveals her, her breasts to the aliens to distract them before a giant wall thing crushes them and flattens them. Oh! Give it to me, you great big burning hunks of green, um, computer. We're going to need some privacy. Can you please close blast section 19? Core implosion estimated in See? 30 seconds. No one ever takes me seriously. So after their confrontation with Saris, the ship has taken an extensive amount of damage and they need to repair the sort of the energy crystal or the... Beryllium, beryllium core. crystal. Now, or core, which... I do have, you know, there's sort of an inconsistency here, a plot hole, if right. you will, okay. where the writers of the show always yeah. said that this was the crystal, the core that would power the ship. Yeah, yeah. Yet, in reality, that is also true, because the ship is now powered by this imaginary sort of energy, yeah, which yeah. they have to go to a planet to find some. Yes. So, it's almost like, did this universe that they created in this TV show get brought into existence by their writing? Or, That's a good point, actually. Or did this, or, or were the writers of this show originally aliens in the first place and knew that this was an actual energy source in space? I think. Well, I, I think it's just a plot hole. Yeah, I was going to say. I think the Thermian. I think Maltazar actually says that they created the beryllium sphere from this designs yeah. that were put up online. How they were able to do that, <laughs> no fucking clue. <laughs> you know. But then obviously the fact that it gets it gets fractured and then they go to a planet which mines these things. So then it's like, well, ha Maldasar, how did you make this if there's a planet full of them? <laughs> and I do think it's really, I mean, it's just, watching the film 
multiple times, you realise that it is like a really elongated episode of Galaxy Quest with the fact that it's so it's so ludicrous that this thing has been damaged and yet they are not that far away from a planet <laughs> with some on. <laughs> And it's one of my favourite sequences in the film when they go down to the planet. And of course, Sam Rockwell almost stealing the show again. Yeah. When, you know, he's he's afraid to go down to the planet. He's like, I'm the red shirt. I'm going to die. Maybe I should stay on the ship. But if I stayed on the ship, an alien would have got on board and killed me. So maybe <laughs> yeah. I'll come down here. Maybe I'll stay in the in the shuttle. But no, an alien will get me in here. So What's my last guys. name? What's my last name? None of you know my last name. <laughs> Nobody knows. Do you know why? Because my character isn't important enough for a last name. Because I'm gonna die five minutes in. Die? You have a last name. Do I? Do I? Yes. For all you know, I'm just crewman number six. Uh, but we are then introduced to pretty much the most CGI heavy moment in the film. Yeah. Which yeah. I will say from 1999, it holds up really well. We see these sort of childlike alien creatures sort of emerging out of the rocks and out of the ground. And then we see a sort of a crippled one yeah, limping over to, to, to drink some water. And, of course, Guy is just like, I've seen this before. I know what's going to happen. They're going to eat everybody. They're going to be horrible mutated aliens. <laughs> yeah. Being right. I can kind of now see why it got an R rating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just speaking about the special effects. I mean, this, Stan Winston. Yet yeah. Yeah. Stan Winston once again. But the 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 CGI effects, especially with the the rock creature that will turn up later, is does still stand up. But the effects for Cyrus, mm, not so much. Not so much. I feel I still like him. He's still an awesomely designed character but the fact that obviously with modern day technology and cgi and stuff like that when you see a prosthetic model especially one in 1999 the, the lips don't seem to add, you know sync up to what he's talking you know and literally the camera cuts away while he's still talking just to keep the sentences flowing yeah so as brilliantly designed as he is update him a little bit Stan Winston did design the headpiece so that all of the facial animations that the actor was giving would come through on the prosthetics ah, so there wow. was no you know electronics in it yeah. it was all the actor sort of portraying um, to the best of his ability underneath all of that I thought it was electronic I thought it was one of those stand by the side with a remote control no, no it was all controlled by the actor wow um, which does add an extra level of you know rea dimension or reality of dimension to that uh, but I would say that I think the villain is a bit of stock, generic, bad guy villain. He's sort of the sort of everyday villain you would get on a Star Trek episode where he's just there and he just wants to blow stuff up. There's no real <laughs> rhyme or reason. It's like, I don't like this alien race. I'm going to exterminate them all. Why? No reason. No reason. Just, <laughs> just, 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 we can. Got this big weapon. You know, got this huge ship. Yeah, but I will say that his performance is pretty damn good. And of course, un unfortunately, another actor which passed away. He was also a great voice actor on the Mass Effect series um, as Saeed. Nice. Nice. Once the crew have found their new sphere and gotten it on board, uh, Jason has taken his top off and fought the rock monster. Hmm. Never seen them <laughs> anything like that before. <laughs> and it... I, I do love that little fight sequence, especially with the digital transmitter trying to send that pig thing up, which is... <laughs> Reminiscent to the fly all over again. But once they get back on board the ship, it kind of, it kind of guards the guards gets a little bit, you know, sad. Really, Cyrus has managed to get on board the ship and has taken Maltazar hostage, and he's torturing him trying to get information about the Omega-13. And the Omega-13 was a weapon that they used in the TV series, but... Well, it was an unknown. It was a cliffhanger ending. That's it. It was a cliffhanger ending, and so nobody knew what it did. So the Thermians, in their immense wisdom, have constructed the Omega-13 and have no idea what it does. Does it destroy all living matter, or does it rewind time to 13 seconds? You don't know yet. 
Um, but Saris is obviously wanting this weapon, and to save Maldastar's life, Jason shows Saris the historical footage, which Saris then realizes that these people that he's been fighting it, fighting against for ages are nothing more than just liars. And I kind of, I don't know how, how, but the way that Tim Allen explains it to Maltazar and the actor playing Maltazar emotes. Aww. Yes, you understand that, don't you, Mathazar? Mathazar, I, I'm not a commander. I, uh, there's no National Space Exploration Administration. We, we don't have a uh, ship. All of the actors do a fantastic job, and when you cut to Sigourney Weaver, who's also feeling the hurt with having to deliver this, it just, it's a beautiful moment, and you just think that that level of drama and yeah. storytelling in amongst, you know, a, you know, a sci-fi adventure tale, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's done, it's handled fantastically well, and I'll also say that the music score really punctuates when you should feel sad and it really elevates you and energizes you when the yeah. music kicks in again you're like wow, i want to watch the next episode now <laughs> yeah. yeah once i mean like i said the music starts to build once they, they they they're getting sent to the airlock you know cyrus is like right blow the humans out of the airlock set the ship to self-destruct get me the omega-13 we're we're out of here we're done you know i've got everything and then this group of actors Kind of pull a McLean on him. You what? <laughs> you know, they they managed to they, they managed to escape their captors. They managed to split up. They managed to formulate a plan. They managed to beat the crap out of everybody. They managed to. <laughs> I love the fact. <laughs> I love the fact that they set the self the Thermians set the self destruct to stop at one second. Three, two, one. It almost makes you think that the ship actually then will not have a self-destruct sequence on it because the ship's never exploded in a TV <laughs> show from a self-destruct. So I <laughs> don't think it actually even has one. <laughs> Just a timer which counts down to one second. Oh, it always stops at one on the show. Um, what were you saying? All of the, all of the tropes are, are just, you know, they become redundant in in the actual tv shows after a while you sort of go yeah okay can you can call it you can yeah, predict it yeah but when when it's done in this film it is just because we're aware of the jokes we're aware of the cliches we're in on the joke and it just uh, just makes it so much better to watch yeah yeah we do have a, a another emotional scene with alan rickman's dr lazarus character when his sort of number one fan is shot yeah and he's dying yes. and you know alan rickman's sort of character has been against playing Dr. Lazarus this whole time, you know, he's sick of it. Yeah. But when he realizes how much this character has meant to this person who is dying, yeah. and he says his famous line with such conviction that the, the, you know, the alien sort of passes away sort of gracefully. By Grabthar's hammer, by the sons of Warvan, you shall be avenged. Which have then just, uh, it's just a, another fantastic moment in the film. Yeah, it harkens back, like we said, to, to, to Spock and Kirk from yeah. Wrath of Khan. Of course. You know, it just, it just harkens back to this actor just being enveloped by his character then. You know, he spent ages trying to be something else and then realizes that this is the best he'll ever be. And the way he just runs at that alien, you know, <laughs> I'm just like, man, you in fucking trouble now. <laughs> One of the another cool scene as well before we, before we come to the end uh, is is the Omega Thirteen being activated. The, the way that they they are they they finish everything off. We have this massive big finale and everything gets saved, and then Cyrus turns up pretending to be the engineer and literally just shoots everybody. You know, I'd like to point out that he does shoot everyone. He shoots the captain. He shoots he shoots everyone except for Guy. And everyone else is almost dead except for him, which I thought was just 
hilarious. That's brilliant. <laughs> but what made me laugh as well was Tim Allen activates the Omega-13 and it rewinds 13 seconds. And he remembers and everybody else doesn't. And so he's able to stop Saras once he comes through the elevator. Once they do, and the humans are like, we're going too fast to get into Earth's atmosphere. We need to break off from the ship. And the Thermians are like, okay, yeah, you, you take this half of the ship and we'll take this half. See you later. And they leave <laughs> Saras on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> they knock him out. And I'm like, that's an evil war general. You're just going to leave the evil war general on the floor. <laughs> Nothing could go wrong there. No. <laughs> of course, there is sort of, I mean, I, you can't really call it a plot hole. I mean, it's so close to the end of the film. But yeah, they crash back onto Earth. They tear up this convention car park. Yeah, yeah. Careen right into the building. No casualties. No one's injured. No one's hurt. Or at least we're not shown that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, you're just kind of wondering, where's the FBI? Where's the where's NASA? Uh, see, where's, where's... <laughs> see, I figured this out because... At the end, they they say about how the TV series has been revitalized after 18 years and they've got all new special effects. So I reckon once they crashed and everyone was like, oh, great special effects. The FBI did turn up along with NASA and the government and took all the alien technology and were like, here, here's some money to make your TV series. <laughs> you know, we're going to take these blasters and this all this other technology and we're going to do shit with it. Well, there has been talks of a Galaxy Quest sequel for many, many years. I mean, it's already been nearly 20 years since the film came out. Nice. Unfortunately, we have lost actor Alan Rickman, um, which, in which case I would also say, don't now ever make no, Galaxy Quest no, 2. No, don't ever. Because you could, you could blemish this near-perfect film by, by doing so. It has such a great beginning, middle and end. The characters are so wonderful that you would want to see the continuing continuing adventures of. Yeah. But keeping it self contained, having this just this one film, don't don't remake it, don't sequelize it. Yeah. I have many favourite scenes in the film. The whole film is very quickly becoming a favourite scene. I guess I would say I mean it's hard that all of the actors do such a great job and the the film doesn't ever linger on one character too much they no. all get equal screen time yeah they all give fantastic performances and but i'm gonna have to say sam rockwell does steal the film for me his whiny bitchy attitude him sort of crying at every sort of possible sort of outcome uh any scene with with sam rockwell just just brilliant i think one of the most memorable is when they first land on the ship and the aliens come out but they forget to wear their sort of um cloaking cloaking devices so that they thing. don't appear human yeah so we see these octopus type creatures that sort of make lots of noise and once they turn back and ask if they want the tour <laughs> some guy just lets out this this scream which was sort of improvised at the time and you can see sigourney weaver's actual sort of nervous jump to him <laughs> yeah. his reaction uh it's just a brilliant moment caught on film who wants the grand tour I have loads. Uh, my first is when the Thermians first turn up at the convention, just the way that they talk, the way they act. I mean, every every sequence with the Thermians later on, the, like I said, the way they walk, the way they act around, the way they just interact with each other, and the fact that they are just these weird squid creatures that's messed up. Um, Tim Allen in his first teleporting sequence, just the look on his face once the back end of the ship opens up and he, he realizes he's in deep space and in a lot of deep shit really and then just the reaction of him being at the swimming pool when he gets back it's awesome uh by grabthar's hammers what are savings by grabthar's hammer what are savings all right. You can just see the look on Alan Rickman's face like, am I really having to say this? Yes, I'm having to say this. And he just he just pulls it off brilliantly. Tommy taking the ship out and the fact that he scratches the nose along the along the starport. I got another problem with this bit. What? It doesn't make any sense. What? Have you seen this, the shape of that ship? Yeah. It has the nose part. 
Yeah. And then it has giant wings on either side of it. Yeah. So if the nose was yeah. hitting the side, yeah. where the hell were the wings? Uh, science fiction. Nah. S- science fiction. <laughs> Plus the fact as well, I think I think the starport was just like two long, elongated arms, so he could have tilted it, tilted the protect. I, I don't bloody know. <laughs> Why this just stuff? Doesn't make sense because when you see the ship come out, the wings are all. <laughs> yeah, they're making sound in space as well. You know the whole scratching. Uh, Jason's big plan. Uh, he's talking to Saris, and he makes the kill signal to to scorny weaver and she does the same thing and then he formulates this whole plan with guy and he insults saris and then sigourney weaver is just like uh you're still on and saris is like i'm not as stupid and as ugly as you think i am are you hmm. i just that was awesome uh the pig lizard being teleported being turned inside out and then exploding and what <laughs> makes it even better is not only Sigourney Weaver's constant hold please line <laughs> when she's communicating with Jason, but it's the fact that Tommy is trying to give fighting tips to Jason and says about hitting the weak points of a rock. The eyes, the nose, the vulnerable spots. <laughs> it's a rock! It doesn't have vulnerable spots! Just uh, another FYI. There was a deleted scene where there was more information given about this rock creature. Right. And apparently this rock creature was aggravated and frustrated with vibrations, with with noise Ah. and with things aggravating it. So when the rock creature is finally vented out into space, there's sort of a tranquil calm Ah. because the rock creature is now free from all vibrations and planets and people. So it's kind of like a... A, I, a fond farewell to this rock creature who's I actually where that. it wants to yeah. be. Because when you see him floating out, I, he, he looked he looked really calm and I thought, well, he can't be breathing, so he can't be dying. Why does he look kind of happy? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. And my fa- final scene is uh, the Lazarus and Taggart fight when they're trying to escape from their captors and the way that um, Taggart kind of brings it up to Dr. Lazarus and says, you know, you're you're being like you were in episode 23. And Lazarus is like, oh, yeah. And they use their knowledge of the episode to help them fight out. And then, yeah, just the whole big explosive finale, the rescuing the shipmates, the calling in the nerds, the Omega-13, the big shootout, the rock monster, the chompers, the dramatic death scene. You shall be avenged, Saris attacking and kill everybody. The the rewind and then the turning up at the convention and the bang and oh. <laughs> Definitely recommend Galaxy Quest. It is it is such a joy to watch. It's what an hour and forty minutes that goes at a breakneck speed. It crams in all of the best things that ever happened in the Star Trek movies, yeah. the Star Trek TV shows. It it is a joyride. The it, you know you have your your awaiting missions, you have your space battles, you have these fantastic pieces of dialogue, and it's a film made for fans. It's a, it's made by fans for the fans. It's rewarding as a fan to watch it, to, to see something that we love just sort of, you know, brought to the big screen again, or it just envelops all those good feelings that you have. Being a fan of any specific genre or TV show, definitely recommend Galaxy Quest. Fantastic acting, brilliant music, Great editing, cinema photography, it's just, it's nigh on perfect. Everything Gary said, plus Sigourney Weaver's breasts. I mean, this is unreal. (laughs) Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews. And it exploded.